That's an oldie but goodie, isn't it? Wasn't that George Beverly Shea used to do that? Billy Graham Crusades. All right, let me invite you to please turn in your Bibles to Galatians in chapter 5. Galatians in chapter 5. Now, we're going to have to put up a mailbox this morning. Do you all know what that means? When somebody says we're going to have to put up a mailbox, that means we could be here a while. It's like a couple of weeks, and I've been storing up for this very moment. And um, um, a family member that I know asked me years back, he said, do, do people sleep when you preach? I said, uh, no, it's hard to sleep when you're mad. <laughs> it is a guarantee the content of this message this morning will make you mad because it has to do with sin. Sin needs to be declared in the churches from the pulpits. Are y'all with me? Uh, Jesus died because of sin. He shed his blood because of the evil of sin. So it has to be something that is addressed Christians are not exempt from sin nor the power of its temptations and persuasions. However, we can have the victory through Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so that's what we're going to look at. Now, in modern times, uh, basically pastors are threatened to stay off of politics. Don't you dare preach on politics. Don't you dare tell us who to vote for. And they sort of want to approach it from a separation of church and state, right? That you have the secular order and that you have the spiritual order and they need to be separate. My friends, they are not separate. Everything about your life and your well-being has to do with the spiritual matters that are going on in this world, even in the secular order. It is a demonic cesspool out there right now. And so things that are determined to be political are actually theological. And they're spiritual as we look at them. Now, this is the second part of a three-part message and I was kind of struggling with, well, next week is homecoming. Why should, I, why should I preach for homecoming? Well, it turns out part three fits right into homecoming. So I'm just going with it. Amen. I was preaching right through the Bible here. So we're in Galatians there in chapter 5. Now, in verses 16 through 18, we've already seen and addressed that. It had to do with the spirit of liberty and in that Paul has told us that we have a war of wills. As a Christian, there, are a, there is a war of wills in your life that seeks to rule and have authority over us. There is, of course, the will of God, and there is the will of the flesh or the will of self. And they are embattled, they are estranged, there is a struggle there that exists. And so Paul is telling them there the only way that that can ultimately be accomplished is by walking in the Spirit, thus the liberty for which and by which we have been called. Now, this morning, we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 21. And it has to do with the spirit of lawlessness. The spirit of lawlessness. Have you ever heard that term, antinomianism? Well, it's just a long word that simply means no law. There is a group of uh, uh, professing believers within Christendom that believe that there is uh, the Christian liberty actually is license that we can basically live like we want how we want but that is not the case 
As it concerns the law, Paul makes the distinction here is, look, the, the, the law essentially is the standard. It's what it means, the, the rule, the order. And in respect to the law, it is God's righteous standard, okay? And we have it, of course, that is written by way of the scriptures, but you know it is also written within your conscience whereby you've experienced guilt and conviction and thus bringing about confession and hopefully, hopefully repentance. So concerning the law, it was never the means of righteousness. And that was Paul's point. It's always been the point of God. The law could not affect or bring about righteousness. So what is the law ultimately for? It is, of course, to manifest God's righteousness, to manifest his standard. Now, when you look at the law and its application to the church, you have to look at it from the factor of what kind of law? Is it ceremonial law? Is it civil law? Judicial law? Moral law? Primarily, it has to do with the moral law in relation to righteousness or being in right standing with God and being that which is godly and holy and just and righteous in the sight of God. So it's literally a, uh, in, in, in respect to contrasting these things, the, the flesh and the law versus the spirit and truth. So there's a spirit of lawlessness that Paul is telling them there that they should be aware of. So verses 16 through 18, the war of wills. Verses 19 through 21, the works of wrath. All right, if you found that in your Bibles, let me invite you to please stand for a moment as we read God's word together. Beginning in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest or plain or evident. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Endings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So he ends right there with such like. It's like Paul could go all day naming these things. Amen? There is a lot to deal with in respect to sin or the inclinations of the flesh. And so to include everything that was unmentioned, he said such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me put that in layman's terms. They will not go to heaven. Plain enough? All right, amen. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, you know all things you know our hearts you know our struggles you know our needs and you know our concerns father as we look to the scriptures and the imminent danger of sin and the wicked one that seeks to undermine our faith to overcome our faith to destroy our faith and lord sin divides us from you the tempter is always ever present lord in many ways trying to disrupt our relationship with you i pray lord as believers we would come to terms with the reality of the spiritual life and the spiritual warfare that we are in and that we would rise to the challenge, abiding in the Holy Spirit, that we might, Lord, walk worthy of this call for which we are called. We love you, Lord, and we submit ourselves to you, humbly receiving this, your word, in accordance to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. All right. 
Let's look at, there's two parts under this, the works of wrath. And the first is the characteristics of the flesh. The characteristics of the flesh. So he is going to be contrasting a extreme difference between lostness and saved. Being saved. In that he is going to show the characteristics of the fallen, sinful, disobedient, rebellious nature of the lost person as, as in contrast to the work of the abiding Holy Spirit that should rule within the heart of believers. And so that's, we get into that next week when we deal with the fruit of the Spirit. So the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. Now, notice here the very first thing that he says. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. This word here for manifest is literally apparent or plain, and it suggests Something that is done on a repetitive, continuous, um, uh, habitual way. That it is, it is something that they do in a practical way. So they are practicing this wickedness. And they have these characteristics because they basically are reflections of who they are and what they are about. If you remember over in 1 John... 1 John talks about he that is born again cannot sin. And people get sort of confused with that and say, well, what is he saying there, that we're above sin? No, that's not what John is saying. What John is saying is those who are born again do not habitually practice sin as a way of life, as a uh, uh, sort of a lifestyle that they are, uh, as believers, we are repenters and overcomers by nature. We see and view sin as the enemy. We see, that we see sin as danger, dangerous, something that we should avoid, something that we should be repented of. And so this word here manifests is it's plain as day. Now, in the modern church, we want to justify the, the, uh, the rebellious, not just in the world, but also in the church. Well, they're just people, and they're imperfect creatures, and that's what they do. And we sort of, we sort of justify them, and we excuse them for their behavior. And so what we're seeing here is Paul saying, no, 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 no. You should see a stark difference between someone who is saved and someone who is lost. Extreme difference. But you know what's going on now? There is a blending, if you will, of the church and the culture whereby they want to just, okay, just dismiss sin as a subject even to address or sin as a, a inability to identify it or define it as such. And so we're just one big happy family under the fatherhood of God that have no control over our given situation. And, of course, that is, a, uh, is, is happening now within the modern church. However, church, if you're going to be right with God, you're going to have to deal with sin. You remember the AI situation? They go into the promised land. You got Joshua leading the children of Israel. We're going to go over there. Boy, they had a victory at Jericho. Man, God was with us. They go into Ai, and all of a sudden, God was not with them. Well, why was God with them in Jericho and not with them in Ai? Because they had entertained sin. They had sin in the house or sin in the camp. 
God will never bless a church that condones or abides in sin. He won't do it. And so it is a grievance against the Holy Spirit and a quenching of the Holy Spirit, and it will not be tolerated. Let me ask you this. Uh, how much tolerance does God have for sin? Y'all know what tolerance is, right? Zero. So that's, you and I should have the same uh, approach, if you will, about sin. We should have zero tolerance. You say, well, I keep dealing with this sin that so easily, easily besets me. It's my weak point. Well, hey, keep pushing through. Keep, keep confessing. Keep repenting over and over and over until you ultimately get the victory. Amen? You can get the victory, but you've got to take it on. You've got to take it on. And so let's go through this list one at a time. First off, it says here, adultery is first on the list. And that is, of course, breaking the marriage covenant. In adultery, it is used in the scripture in two manners. One is physical adultery, the violation of the marriage covenant, whereby one spouse violates the covenant by going in to another outside of their spouse, their marriage, thus defiling the marriage bond. Physical. Then there is spiritual, whereby adultery was used uh, in addressing God's people is that you are playing the harlot, you are, you are defiling the, the covenant that God made with them. It was essentially a, a, an eternal covenant, a marriage covenant, if you will, and that you have, uh, uh, you have played the fool, you've played the adulterer, and you have gone after other gods. And so it is also used as spiritual adultery. And so you have to look at it as such. God is not going to share you with the world. He is not going to share you with other pagan gods. As the scripture says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we think uh, another god is some kind of uh, uh, material, some kind of statue, some kind of uh, thing like that that you bow down to. No, 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 no. It is something that literally has your heart and thus controls your life. Anything that you put before God. Are y'all with me? Now, the next one is fornication. This is related to adultery. In fornication, it is, of course, sexual immorality. It is harlotry. It can be used in association with adultery, but it's also used in respect to idolatry. And therein, it also can have a physical and a spiritual application. The third one is uncleanness. That is, any unnatural pollution, whether acted out by oneself or with another. And so uncleanness, and usually that has a sexual connotation attached to it. It is perversion, corruption, being defiled, being uh, 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 defiled by the world, if you will. The next one, number four, is licent lasciviousness. This is readiness for all pleasure. Isn't the, the slogan of the world, if it feels good, do it? Right? Right? If it, and, and so they would accommodate the world according to their pleasures. They also have another term for this called hedonism. And those that would give, be given to the appetites of the flesh. Remember what I was talking about about a few weeks ago in Gnosticism, flesh bad, spirit good. And they had this separation. So what I did, in, what I do in the flesh doesn't matter because it is under the power of sin and darkness. But what I do in the spirit, that's what matters. That's a part of the realm of light and my relationship with God. No, they're together. 
You're, you are a whole person. When Jesus said, I come to make you whole, that is to make you complete in him. That's body, soul, and spirit. So we see that number five, there is idolatry, the worship of idols and false gods. Our culture is increasingly becoming demonic. It's increasingly becoming satanic. They are given to the order of darkness. They are succumbing to the, the satanic uh, kingdom, the satanic system. And that darkness, by the way, is increasing. Evil is increasing. And listen, there are things that are going on in our time, in our world, and in our culture that would make the, free, the pre-flood inhabitants of the earth blush. What we see in our time would be completely unheard of in their time. We think of the pre-flood era as so wicked and so defiled that it had to be completely destroyed. That they did everything according to the imaginations of their hearts. The same is true today. Remember that the day in which we live in the church age or the end of the church age prior to the Lord coming and getting us, is that they will be as the days of Noah. Full-blown wickedness. Do not depend on your government or a culture to be the guiding, guiding light and the provider and protector of you. As believers, we God has our back and he alone has our back. Other than that, we're on our own. And the increasing hate toward God's people, both Israel and the church, will be on the increase. But by and large, most of the church have adopted the world and have assimilated into the world. And matter of fact, they're very much partners with the world whereby if you still have conviction about what the Word of God says, by the way, which contradicts what the world says, then you're going to be in trouble in the very near future, if not now. And as the saying goes, they're coming for us. And you say, well, why are they coming for us? Or what, what would make you say such a thing? They're coming for you because you stand in the way of their agenda. You stand in the way of their progress, of them bringing about this perverted utopia called the New World Order that they want to implement. Are y'all with me? The church and its values and what we believe about sexuality, what we believe about the family, what we believe about marriage, what we believe about morals contradicts everything right now that the government and the established order is trying to literally run down our throats. So then we look at the sixth thing, and that's witchcraft. Now when we get to this part, we think people dressed up in black outfits and a pointy hat and they got a lot of brooms around the house. That's what we think when we think of witches, right? No, 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 no. It is a very much a more expanded <laughs> definition than that. Let me give an example by way of the definition here. It can mean medication. It can mean magic. It can mean sorcery. It can literally be those that are given to occultic persuasions, opening themselves up to the spiritual underworld. Those who are 
literally flirting with the demonic realm. Listen, when you give Satan an open door, he will gladly enter in. I heard this thing the other day. You know how when you're streaming the Internet trying to glean information on there, I ran across this thing. I have to tell it. It's funny and ridiculous as everything. But the guy was saying that if you got one of those floor mats outside of your house that sells, says welcome, do y'all have any of that? Like it's no sun, what, you take and, and wipe off your feet a welcome mat. He says that welcome mat there at your door, that's an invitation for demons to come in. Have y'all ever heard of anything so absurd in your mouth, in, in your life? That's not what that means. That means that your neighbors and your family and your friends are welcome in your house. However, going back to that opening yourself up, you can't open yourself up to demonic interference and oppression if you're not careful. There are those that... Uh, like use inc incantations. Uh, those, there are persuasions out there. Have you heard of, it's something that I believe along the lines, it's called manifestation. And what you do is you believe something so strong and so long and so hard, just you, you can believe it into existence. Very, very much an occultic thing. What about our potions? Um, things whereby we are medicating ourselves. Do you know that there is a relationship between the occult and drug use or alcoholism as well, drunkenness and all that? And... Uh, have I got the drunkenness yet? I don't know, save that or not. I might, might want to save a little bit of that. But, but let me save that, okay? Let's, let's, let's just let's move on to number seven and talk about this hatred, hostility, opposition, enmity. Believers should be a, uh, a group of God-fearing, Jesus-loving uh, brotherhood of love with one another. Matter of fact, the Bible says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, because you have love one for another. Matter of fact, my friends, hatred is a very much a part of the modern-day church. You better watch your back in the modern day church. You better be careful in the modern day church. There are those that are given to hatred. And of course, that's an issue of pride. Let's look at number eight, that is variance. Variance related to hatred, it is quarrel, wrangling, contention, debate, strife. Listen, throughout my entire ministry, I have been preaching the churches, cut out those factions Cut out that, that acting like fifth graders. Cut out all of that division and discord and start acting like Christians and start acting like churches. And you would think, boy, they would, they would just pipe up and they're listening and yeah, 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 rah, 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 we're going to do it. But mark my words, they never do it. They always do fall victim to their attitudes and their pride and their own selfish ways. Well, then this leads us to the next one. Number nine is the emulations. That is zeal in an evil sense. There are those that will pursue the, uh, the path of evil and see it to its utter end. It will have its full accomplishment. Sin, sin begins, it is birthed, if you will, as a seed in the heart. Matter of fact, I believe James is the one that deals with this. 
And he talks about the origin of sin and how it basically germinates and how it begins to grow and how it begins to uh, bear fruit, if you will, or manifest, if you will. It will have its full course. So there are those that are prone to do evil. They are prone to these embattlements. And you can't do nothing about it. Listen, my friends. Typically in a church, you will have three animal characteristics that are there. You will have sheep, you will have goats, and you will have wolves. Typically, you might see a goat, they'll get their feathers in a ruffle, and they'll get riled, and they might start some trouble, or they might just pack their bags and leave, and that's typically what you have. A wolf. That may not be the case. A wolf may stay, and they may be somewhat reserved and quiet and tame for a while because they may be outnumbered or have, don't have the opportunity, but make no mistake, it's hard to get a wolf out of a church. It is practically impossible Y'all have heard of a spiritual stronghold? It is str so strong that in some cases, the only way to bring down that stronghold in a church is God may have to kill them to remove them from a church. That's pretty wicked, right? But nonetheless, they are set on that evil. And then number 10, there is wrath. Wrath is a violent outburst. How many of you have a long wick and a short wick? How many of you are volcanoes? Y'all ever seen anybody with a volcano personality? Oh, they got a temper. It's just laying there dormant, right? Until the circumstances are right, and Lord have mercy, get out of the way. It's going to explode. Well, tempers are a part of the human nature. Y'all know that? The Bible says be angry and sin not. There, don't be disillusioned by, uh, the, you know, that you're, you don't have an anger issue. You might have a suppressed anger issue but nonetheless anger still resides anger is the potential for everybody but anger is another part of the flesh that must be subdued under the power of the holy spirit amen now here's the next one we see oh by the way james 1 20 says the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of god you got to hold that, hold that temper down. Uh, number 11, there is strife. Strife is self, selfishness or self-willed. Strife is, strife is a contention of, of uh, uh, advancing one's own um, uh, self. What well, I want, my, my will, my way. And that, of course, can also affect the church. Strife and envy oftentimes are used hand in hand. Number 12 is seditions. Seditions is faction, sedition, separation. Pretty much as I was talking about earlier, a warlike environment, a very contentious environment. Do you know when you come into a church, that if that church is out with one another and they're out with God, even a lost person can sense something is wrong in that church. But you know if the spirit is right and it's a unified spirit and they're doing what God wants them to do, then they can feel or sense the grace of God there. And that's how it should be. You and I should be under the grace and peace and love and unity of God. Here's the 13th one that is heresies. That is a form of religious worship, discipline, or opinion. Now, this is where we're going to get a little bit political, and I think we need to this morning. 
is that you and I live in a time, in, particularly in America, that's the context from which we live, that is the culture of which we live, and you and, li you and I live in a time like no, no other in, human, in, in American history, none other. The Constitutional Republic is on its way to, to demolition. Are y'all with me? And we are emerging to an authoritarian, socialistic state. And it is happening very quickly. And you say, well, uh, those, those D's, man, they're taking us down. And boy, those R's, they're going to bail us out. Not so fast. They still are on the same team working for the same guy, and his name is Satan. Don't put your trust in government. If you do, you are foolish. You say, you called me a fool. No, I did not. I said you're foolish. You don't have a clear spiritual discernment about what's going on. It doesn't matter who walks into the White House. Listen, matter of fact, I can take a rock and throw it into a group of people and hit somebody more qualified to be in the White House than what's there now. And don't think that they have your back or they're going to rescue you or they're going to bail you out and that they are the source of life's ills and problems. They are the problem themselves. Reagan said that. The government is not the solution, it's the problem. And they're going to keep on with their antics. And guess what? The church is bought into that stuff, hook, line, and sinker. That's why you got so many in churches that are divided politically. They, may I say, you need to be united biblically. If you're united biblically, those politics would be set aside. And a preacher could stand up in the pulpit and call you out for offending God. If you go into the voting booth come November and you put your vote down on someone that embraces killing babies. Listen, y'all taking them out of the womb full term, setting them on the table, and executing them. Full-blown murder and death, legally endorsed by your government and those politicians that put those mess, those laws into effect. And you want to say, I'm right with God, and you go vote for that? You are not right from God. You're on the devil's side, and you are committing sin, egregious sin. Or those that support homosexuality, no, my friend, man and woman, husband and wife, heterosexuality, not homosexuality. You've got those platforms that endorse an anti-Christ belief and agenda, and then we want to go roaming into there and vote for that. You cannot and profess being a Christian. You are denying the faith, and you are, in fact, anti-Christ. That's not going to fly in your typical mega church today. Is it? In Matthew chapter 5, 29 and 30, the context of that particular, met the, uh, the word that Jesus is giving in that Sermon on the Mount has to do with adultery. But I want to take it and apply it just in, with sin in general, particularly as it relates to abandoning the faith and defiling the faith and offending God in the voting process. He, he says there, in, if your right eye offend thee, pluck it out and throw it away from you. 
If your right hand offends you, cut it off and throw it away from you. In other words, Jesus said, you're better off making those sacrifices so you can enter into heaven whether to do those things and to keep those things and to hold those things and bust hell wide open. Boy, it got quiet in here. Almost hear a pin drop. The 14th is envyings. Envy or pain felt and malignity conceived at the sight of excellence or happiness. Malice. It, when, I, when I read this, it reminded me of Cain and Abel. Y'all remember that? Cain had envy came up in his heart because of the favor that God gave his brother Abel. And it took root and it festered, and like a dormant volcano, it exploded when he killed his brother. Interestingly, it leads to the 15th one here, and that is murders. That is to slay or to slaughter. It can have a physical or spiritual application, and if you've got unforgiveness in your heart or hatred toward another, you might as well be be guilty of murder itself, the Bible tells us. All right, here's that one we've been waiting on, y'all. Buckle up. Number 16 is drunkenness. At one time, the church used to have a pretty strong position about using alcohol. Matter of fact, we boast. Y'all remember when they used to have those church covenants up? Why, well, we're not going to do any drinking. We won't even so much as sell it. Do y'all remember that? And so there was a teetotal, you know, approach to that. And some say, well, that came out of the Prohibition era, and that's how all that came about. No, listen, when the Bible talks about drunkenness, it's not talking necessarily about somebody that's passed out in a gutter. It is talking about those who are uh, uh, literally prone to drinking and thus coming under the uh, toxic, intoxicating influence of a foreign body that is more proven to be unhealthy and detrimental to the body. Some people say, oh, I just do it socially. I just have me a little nightcap, you know. I, oh, whatever, tell that to the drunk or the ex-alcoholic in, in AA trying to get over its power. You get you a little nip and keep nipping and keep nipping and it might just nip you. Boy, that's an unpopular. It got quiet in here again. Now in churches, man, everybody's drinking. Clink, clink, let's all party time. May I say, it alters your personality. It alters your, your, your mind. Uh, it, it can have devastating effects and consequences. And you cannot, when you talk, listen, back then, drunkenness is a general term, meaning that it could apply to anything foreign that, that ultimately uh, induces some kind of an intoxicating uh, uh, effect on the body. So in our time, we have to include drugs. By the way, drugs were also used in relation to witchcraft or sorcery. Drugs have been around since the dawn of creation. Now, there are drugs that are needed for medicinal purposes. Those things that, can, that are, uh, are for the health and well-being of an individual. There are those who have, who have chronic health problems that need medication. God knows that. And by the way, me modern medicine is a miracle given by God to sustain and to prolong life. Amen? Here's where it gets corrupted. 
back when uh, I was young, growing up, during the baby boom time, people having four, five, six plus kids. Do y'all know that six kids running around in the house can drive you absolutely crazy? One or two, man, is rough. You talk about six, man, that's a whole tribe. And you're trying, it's like herding cats to keep them all together and try to raise them. Guess what? Back in that day, it was common among housewives to uh, get on what they called the nerve pill. Y'all remember that? They were popping volumes like Tic Tacs, man. I mean, just trying to cope with life. May I say anybody that deserves to be an alcoholic or a drug addict is a preacher. You try to be a preacher and you cannot go and, uh, and go to a substance to bail you out of reality. There's nothing there but the good Lord. And then, man, guess what? When, when he's all you have, he's all you need. He is sufficient. The point of it is, is to not to be uh, manipulated in your senses to where you don't even have control. All right, number 17, revelings. This revelings is derived from coma, C-O-M-U-S, the God of feasting and reveling, resulting in impure obscenities. Much of these things were in, involved in pagan practices of the day, the Jews also were guilty of succumbing to these occultic practices as well. These pagan uh, uh, gods that they uh, worshipped. And, uh, and it is a, uh, those that were given to a, uh, this euphoric, uh, um, um, basically indulgence, that uh, in, a, in a group manner that is related to their rebellion and their, their wicked religious uh, uh, attachments as well. So revelings, partyings, um, those that were given to such things. And then the 18th is, and such like. Anything that is ungodly, unrighteous, unholy, that is all such like. So Paul is saying here, look at all of this sin. Look at all of it. Look at all of these characteristics. Well, what does it say elsewhere in the scriptures? Let's look. Write this down. Romans chapter 1. Yikes, time has... Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Please be patient with me this morning. Romans chapter 1 and verse 29 through 32. It says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, mal maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, dis despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, and disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, Im implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them. So those who engage and those who are entertained by are guilty alike. Then look in um, 1 Corinthians in chapter 6 really quickly. 1 Corinthians in chapter 6 and, uh, in, <clears throat> and in verse... 9 and 10, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then in, you write this down, Ephesians in chapter 5. Ephesians in chapter 5, verses 3 through 7. 
Ephesians 5, 3 through 7, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks for for this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person or, nor covetous man nor is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, but because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And then he goes on to say, do not be partakers with them. Then in Colossians, Colossians in chapter 3, Colossians in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, and inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. It says, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. You were once from that persuasion. Note that these things that are mentioned back in our scripture in Galatians, it says concerning them, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, there is a condemnation in the future for them. That's your second point there. And two things, very quickly. One, they're judged by works. They which do such things, those who habitually and repeat, repetitively practice those characteristics, they are continuous in them, they are controlled by them, and they even choose to do them. Okay? A tree is known by its fruit, so they are judged by their works. And it says, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They are judged by the wrath of God. They have the wrath of God. Listen, we as the children of God are not appointed to wrath, are we? There's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You and I have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ that took upon himself the wrath of God for sin as our mediator, as our substitute, as our sacrifice. However, those who go into their death and in the, into their eternity without Christ in their sin will perish in the judging wrath of God. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In Ephesians, quickly, at chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says there, Wherefore in time past ye walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or our behavior in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. It talks about in those two verses, the children of disobedience essentially are the children of wrath, and there will be an eventual judgment. So do not offer excuses for those who are abiding in sin. Do not offer excuses for your own sin. The Lord is calling us to repentance. He is calling us unto Christ-like righteousness. And he is calling us to stand up in a very dark and depraved generation. Amen? Please bow your heads with me. Father, as the accompanist and the song leaders come to lead us in this invitation, Lord, we know that you persuade the hearts of men. Lord, we could talk and preach and, and, and say what we believe we need to say till we're blue in the face, but until the Holy Spirit says what needs to be done in the heart of the individual, there will be no move. And so, Lord, we depend on the Spirit of God to do the work of God 
among the people that are present under the message. And so, God, your will be done above our own and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.